But we are so happy that you're spending a Wednesday in February with us on the big Texas Author Talk with Mag Gabbert, um, who I've known since 2017. Mag was the first or second person to teach at Writing Workshops Dallas when we were an in-person uh, workshop here in Dallas. And so I've known Mag uh, for a long time. I've respected her as a teacher and a writer, and it's really thrilling uh, to have her on uh, for her book this evening. And we're thrilled to have Seamus moderating from Los Angeles, if you consider that Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> but you know, this is made possible every month um, with a grant from Humanities Texas. And we have been doing this since the spring of 2020. So we've been doing this for four years now. Of course, you know, at the start of the pandemic, we, David uh, Samuel Levinson, he said, hey, let's get everyone together uh, for a, a reading club, uh, to talk about the, the craft of writing, maybe sometimes the business of writing, and let's celebrate authors that have some sort of connection to Texas. Either they lived here, they write about it, or they're out of the state now or somewhere. So um, David said, I got to introduce you to uh, Alexandra Vandekamp, who uh, is executive director down at Gemini Inc. And together, we've just been doing this, uh, co-hosting this uh, now for four years. And we have a whole archive of these conversations on YouTube, both on the Gemini Inc. YouTube and also on the Writing Workshops YouTube. So um, thank you for being here tonight. Looks like people are here from all over. And um, we're just really excited about this conversation tonight between Mag and Seamus. And I'm going to hand it over to Alexandra Vandekamp, who's going to say some things about Gemini Inc. and then get us started. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, I can't believe it's four years. Oh, my God. Um, but we've had a lot of fun, a great array of author conversations. And I think what we love the most is, you know, when the moderator and author know each other, it just adds like this extra fun element to it. So um, welcome. I just wanted to say briefly that Gemini Inc. is San Antonio's writing arts center. Um, we teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels so they can bring their stories to life. Check us out at GeminiInc.org. Some people think we're a tattoo parlor. We're not, but um, we've actually been in existence for 31 years. <laughs> um, and we just love bringing writers and readers together. So we're very excited to have Mag Gabbert here tonight with Seamus as our guest moderator. I'm going to introduce them a little bit and then get the heck out of the way so you can hear from them. Um, Mag is our featured author. She's the author of Sex, Depression, Animals, um, just out from Mad Creek Books, or actually in 2023, which was selected by Kathy Fagan as the winner of the 2021 Charles B. Wheeler Prize in Poetry. She's also the author of previous chapbooks, The Breakup, which was selected by Kave Akbar as the winner of the 2022 Baltic Writing Residencies Chapbook Award, and the chapbook Minimal Poems, um, out by um, Cooper Dillon Books 2020. Her awards include a Discovery Award from 92nd New York's Uddenburg Poetry Center, a Pushcart Prize, and fellowships from the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop, Idlewild Arts, and Poetry at Roundtop. Mag's work can be also found in some great poetry journals, the American Poetry Review, the Paris Review Daily, Copper Nickel, Guernica, and Poetry Deli, as well as elsewhere. She has an MS, um, MFA from sorry, U, UC Riverside and a PhD from Texas Tech. She lives in Dallas, Texas, and teaches at Southern Methodist University. And there is no shortage of praise for this latest collection, Sex, Depression, Animals. Um, just one example is the award-winning poet Timothy Donnelly says, quote, Gabbert's poems leap off the page, fueled by nerve, passion, dazzling research, and one grief after another. Need drives her to question what it means to be a human, and a powerful poetic gift keeps spinning its answers into scorching music, like so many sunbursts on the tongue. I love this book, <laughs> and I think we're all going to love hearing her read from it. Um, and then we're really thrilled to have Seamus Fay here as our featured moderator. Um, they are a trans writer living in L.A., Currently, they are the poetry editor at Hooligan Magazine and co-creative director at Rock Pocket Productions. Their debut poetry collection, which just came out, is decomposed and is out from not a cult media. His work has appeared in the American Poetry Review, Poet Lore, the Sonora Review, and others. They love to beat their friends at Mario Party, and they can be found um, at S. Sorry, S. Faye Creates. So. 
with no more, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over my invisible mic, <laughs> and um, I would love to let let the conversation begin. Thanks, Alexandra. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, on top of all of that wonderful truth about Mag, she's also an incredible friend, um, a wonderful cat mom, um, and she can be found watching Lord of the Rings. Uh, over there in Texas, as well as teaching and as well as being a very gentle, but very, very moving spirit. And um, we're all lucky to have her in this world, let alone get to hear her talk today. So uh, Mag, if you want to get us started by reading a few poems, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I gave myself a challenge for this event to kind of read pieces that I don't always read from the book, um, which is sort of exciting and different. Sometimes you get into that groove where there are particular pieces you return to time and again, because they sort of are easy to read or read well or whatever. But this time I'm going with some different pieces. Um, I'm going to read about six poems and then we'll just have a conversation. The first piece I'm going to read is one of the oldest poems in the book, or in terms of when it was written. It's called Baby. Um, and it's also sort of central to the collection in a way because it um, deals in a not indirect way, I guess, with an abortion I had when I was 16 um, and sort of the fallout from that. Baby. I don't think about you in an iridescent way. I don't ever look for you in the night. I do not imagine your endlessness. When I think about you, I think about myself and of other real things like dawn on the crumpled sheet or the mountains, the balance between fear and believing in things. You are not a wish. You are a black and white photo of water hidden somewhere in my room. Um. The next poem I'm going to read also deals some with adolescence. Um, and so there's a, a bit of a thematic continuity here. And also, even though it's sort of a sad poem, it's also a sort of a list of some of my favorite things, which is fun to think about. It's called Gum, G-U-M, Gum. I used to love a boy who wrote graffiti, loved iced tea, rooms filled with paintings. When I got sick, my mom would buy me a butterfly cocoon, hung from a stick, cradled on another one that looked like a wishbone. After a week or so, the butterfly would hatch and I'd let it go. Snow days, nail polish, stories with predictable endings, like waking up from a dream into a dream. I love knowing that some species of moths live off the tears of larger animals, that no two lions share the same pattern of whiskers. I love the way the lion cubs hide among the rocks. I love their whole and heavy eyes, their bodies kneeling at their meat. These days, the boy who wrote graffiti is a tattoo artist he gave me a red poppy beneath my arm, and last week he got married. I used to love wedding dresses with lace sleeves. I used to want to let a cheetah eat me as a demonstration of how much I loved them. I used to want to be on a SWAT team or be a mother by age 30. I used to own a little pink sculpture that looked like chewed gum. It might have been my favorite possession. I love gum, love the way it turns beneath my tongue. Um, there aren't many poems in this collection that deal, whether directly or indirectly, with um, the event that the poem Baby describes, but one of those other pieces is this poem Egg. 
Um, so it's also about my experience with abortion as a teenager and also sort of navigating what it means to grow up in a religious family with a lot of um, moral values that made that process very difficult. Um, one thing that I want to note, there are a few spots in this poem where I quote directly from the Bible, um, I think from the King James Version. And so I'll try to sort of give a pause or a way of um, letting you all know when I'm quoting from the Bible in those moments so that you can understand the interchange between that voice and the voice of the speaker in the poem. If you were reading the poem on the page that those parts are italicized. So the piece is called Egg. At Easter every year, we filled eggs with confetti but first we would drain them until each one was light as breath when I held it. I used to find it almost funny that we ate them, little bright pools of beginnings with our bacon. Then we dyed the outsides, each vessel left empty, daffodil yellow, baby blue, sherbet peach, mint green like a nursery. I used to wonder whether Jesus ate meat how his words became flesh, and why he always broke bread, saying, this is my body. Once the eggs were all dry, we would wrap them with tissue to seal in the good news. They found the stone rolled from the tomb. Then one day at the clinic, my secrets were covered with a paper shroud too, and I didn't feel anything except light as confetti, in a sterile white room. But when they entered, and a nurse said, breathe deeply, place each of my feet upon two metal rings. They did not find the body. At least, that's how it seemed. There was only the sheet of thin butcher's paper left underneath. Why do you search for the living? stained almost pink with delicate petals among the dead or little shells. All right, I just have a few more um, and soon we'll be pivoting towards something maybe happier. Uh, but first, before we come to the happier pieces, it is a book called Sex, Depression, Animals, after all. <laughs> uh, before the happier pieces, I'm going to read a poem called June. It's another poem that I wrote very early in the process of working on this book. And um, one that I never particularly thought would get much attention. Uh, but I, I shared this poem in June of the last, last, you know, summer. And people really responded to it in a way that surprised me uh, on social media. June. I talk out loud to a dead person. The dead person says nothing. I tell the dead person that my tendons are threads of pain. My memories have grown fingers that pull threads. They make me float. They keep me at home. They make me watch the birds out my window, moving like smoke in the wind. Okay, I have two more. Both of them come from the section of the book that you can fairly easily identify as the animals section if you just sort of peruse the table of contents. Um, and the first of these is fun to read and it relates to, it. it's sort of fanciful in a way, a little bit magical realist for a, um, my own type of poem. And it relates to a particular kind of test that was performed back in the day uh, in the United States in which um, a rabbit would be injected with, I believe it was um, a woman's urine or something to that effect. And, um, basically in order to see whether the hormones of the rabbit respond uh, and based on that 
And in, in order to discover that, you had to kill the rabbit. Based on that, you could tell whether the woman was pregnant or not. So this is a very sort of um, antiquated version of the pregnancy test, and it was called a rabbit test. So this poem is called Rabbit. The first one jumps out of my carrier, breaks its neck. Sweetly, the man I've been sleeping with buys another for me. When I set it on the bed to nap, it jumps too, easy. These rabbits must be terribly fragile, the man says, a new rabbit now tucked under each sleeve. At night, the rabbits begin nudging against my rib cage, nesting in the cups of my bra. They grow and kick. I snap them like plastic beneath my feet. There's a rabbit in the oven, probably asleep. The man and I no longer speak. We lie, hot and quiet under separate sheets, while rabbits crowd in beside me, still fattening, and more start to tumble out of the boxes, wrappers hidden underneath the bathroom sink. One floats in the toilet like the others, turning from white to pink. And the last piece I'm going to read for right now before we have a bit of conversation is a poem called Orangutan. Um, sadly, I'm hard pressed when people say, read, you know, a happy, sweet, delightful poem from the book. I'm hard pressed to find one <laughs> sometimes, but this particular poem uh, is probably the happiest or in a way most delightful. And it comes from a true story uh, that occurred between me and my childhood best friend, Caitlin, uh, when we went camping one year. But I also sometimes jokingly call it my um, basic white girl poem because it, it just sort of goes through some of the, the delights in my life that are, are utterly predictable. Orangutan. It's New Year's Eve and my life is predictable. I've been to Europe a couple times, done some sightseeing, castles mainly. I have eaten grilled cheese sandwiches and chips flavored with sour cream, watched vampire movies. And one time I did go camping with my best, in a teepee with my best friend after watching the sun rise out of the blue that morning. Later on, we took a bath in a clawfoot tub facing opposite ways nervously laughing every time our damp skin grazed the other and we would say, you're not real, not real, not real, which I guess was surprising and kind of celebratory, like a sudden orangutan too big to shield himself with an umbrella of leaves, very Susie and Muppety and even extraterrestrial or cerebral up there in the trees. Thank you so much, Meg. Thank you. I'm I'm laughing because I feel like as poets, like we almost never have something happy to offer. <laughs> and we all are always like, oh, God, I've got to find something. Like I feel like <laughs> universal like poet struggle. Yeah. But uh, my first question that I have for you sort of stems from like, I don't know if this happened to you, but um, with my book coming out very soon, I've been thinking yeah. so about like how it came to be and like yeah. what I'm grateful for in order for making it happen. Yeah. So my first question for you is out of curiosity for that and for every poet. Um, if you had a writing ancestry tree, who would its branches be made of? Ooh, that's a really fascinating question and a good one. Um, Something that I find really interesting about inspiration, at least for me and for poets who I talk to at length about these things, is how you can have poets who deeply inspire you, that, but that line doesn't always show up in your work necessarily, you know, whose work is quite different from yours. Um, and yet, for some reason, you're tinkering with the things that you see going on in those poems and sort of trying to uh, work with new versions of those things in your own work. At the same time, I don't know, maybe maybe some of what I would consider to be um, 
a type of lineage would make sense. Um, one of the early books that I read that really spoke to me was Sharon Old's first collection, Satan Says. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that book definitely deals with a lot of the things um, thematically that my book deals with. So I can see the connection there for sure. And also maybe some of the, the more conversational type of direct voice and things like that. Um, Dorothy Alasky is another poet whose work was extremely important to me as I first started in on the journey of taking poetry seriously and her work remains extremely important to me. But the collection Thunderbird in particular, um, which came out I think in 2012, that was a formative time for me and the way that Lasky's uh, poems were issuing punctuation and just sort of manifesting in this bizarrely organic way that was still so strange um, was really powerful and meaningful to me. I mean, I think about this one poem all the time that was in that collection, a uh, poem called Wild. And she, in it, she says um, something like, people try to make God human, but God is not human. He stares at you through the eyes of a bear and beats his terrible bearded chest and guffaws into the night. And I just, uh, that wildness and that recklessness mm -hmm. is something that I'm constantly striving toward. But at the same time, I feel like I'm I'm more of a type A person. I'm more like precise. And so I'm I'm always pushing myself to go further into the recklessness. Mm. And, and when I think about like some of the newer collections that really inform that too, I think about, for example, Diane Seuss's yes. much lauded uh Frank Sonnets, right? Yes. Which is just absolutely um. A, a work of true utter recklessness but in the best and most creative innovative way um yep. or I think about Victoria Chang's obit yep uh and and just the riffing on those forms and the amazing things that come out of that exercise you can tell that those books were just written in sort of like a, a fever pitch you know and man, that's what I want. You know, I want to be in it like that, just drilling through that vein. Um, and I think that it takes so much practice and so much, initially so much precision to get to a place where you can let go like that. Absolutely. Well, okay. Great answer. And all of which like makes sense having read your work. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you'd read Lake for us. Yeah, I would love to read Lake. This is actually one of the most, how would I say it? Most recent, newest poems that was written for mm -hmm. the book. Um, like this, this poem was one of the last things I put into the final iteration of the manuscript. So it was written very close to the time when the book started to become a real thing. Mm -hmm. Um. I should mention that it's inspired in part by a wonderful poem by Salmaz Sharif called uh, Vulnerability Study, mm. uh, which I encourage everyone to look at at some point. And I think if you do read that poem and you read my own poem, Lake, that, that you'll see those little bits of echoing each other, um, dealing with the same kinds of subject matter, but going in different directions ultimately. Mm. So yeah, the poem's called Lake. You can't come from behind me anymore because once I said it hurt. A plane floats outside the window like a fish in dark water. I only remember how to make two things out of paper, stars and boats. Every morning by the time we wake up, the day's already broken. When my grandmother had run out of language, I folded a handful of stars as a gift for her, and she just swallowed them. I love this poem so much. Something that I love about this book is um, it's you could really read it as a study of linguistics. Hmm. 
that's well, nice. Thanks. <laughs> emotional linguistics as well as linguistics. Hmm. Like all of the different ways we could look at a lake emotionally happen in those like very beautiful, very succinct uh, cu uh, couplets. Um, so next question for you. Yeah. Um, if this book had a soundtrack, what would be on it? Ooh. Also, quick secret that I, you know, be, it's kind of like children, right? With poems or anything that you put into a collection of work. Um, like you don't want to really disclose, but you do have favorites. Um, <laughs> uh, I do at least. I can't speak for everyone, but Lake is kind of one of my favorite poems too. Um, yeah, the soundtrack. This is a fascinating question to me, partly because I, I'm really interested in the way that people write and, or the writing process. And sort of a lot of folks I know will listen to music as part of the writing process. And then, um, for, or go to a coffee shop, right? And wanna be sort of among people or whatever. And for me, for whatever reason, kind of begrudgingly, the best thing I have found is like silence, mm. real golden utter <laughs> silence. Like no, it's not good, just absolute silence. Yeah, like with some good um, noise canceling headphones on or something. Um, and so I don't typically write with any type of uh, soundtrack, if you will, but there are definitely artists and, and songs that maybe speak to the vibe of the book. Some of the first things that come to my mind are music that was central to me during my adolescence, because this book does, in a way, hinge upon that period of time in my life um my late teens and very early adulthood in particular a time that I'm glad to have written about and hopefully not have to revisit in future <laughs> collections mm -hmm. um and so for example the the biggest one that immediately comes to mind is the first album by the used mm -hmm. um just yeah the the box of sharp objects and the the ballads in there, that whole album was like, extremely important to me at that time and one that I would play on repeat. And it captures a lot of the mood uh, for me and the complexity of that mood. So I would put, yeah, the first album by The Used. Um, you know, in a way, like people who know me well, who are watching this are going to crack up because I'm kind of a broken record when it comes to like what my favorite music is mm. and it's so deeply permeates like every aspect of my life and I'm not that adventurous like I stick with the things that I love um mm. so another hugely uh just formative album for me that to this day I listen to when I need to be kind of steeled against something is um, Linkin Park's Hybrid Theory. Mm. And I think that on the one hand, you could read my book and maybe find it to be sort of quiet in certain ways and, re and definitely you know, reflective or meditative in certain ways. But at the same time, I think you could read it. And especially if you've had any kind of parallel experiences or if you know me very well, then you know that there's like, there's also a deep simmering rage in it. Um, and that's how I feel about hybrid theory. And that was always sort of an outlet for me to be able to release it. Um, so yeah, hybrid theory is another that comes to mind. But then also some, some quieter stuff, some Fiona Apple would probably go in there, some Sia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, more tender things, maybe the Garden State soundtrack, which my best friend who I read about in the poem, Orangutan, she and I used to fall asleep listening to that soundtrack every time we had a sleepover for years. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, those are other other works that come to mind. But I, I do have to go back to that place of ultimately where the, the poems were born, you know, in like my psyche. And in a way, that place persists in my brain. And, and similarly, those 
uh, works of, of music remain equally important to me now, just as they were then. The last one I would throw in that's maybe um, a curveball, but also came to be important to me during my adolescence initially, um, the choral arrangements of Eric Whitaker. Mm. Uh, he, he does some really, really incredible things with dissonance um, in, in those arrangements and some just really profound, I mean, for me, like if, if heaven had a sound, if, if I were maybe a denominally, denominationally religious person and if God, you know, had a, a sound or a music, it would sound like Eric Whitaker's music. Um, and like songs, for example, like Cloudburst or When David Heard, or um, there's a, a gorgeous setting to Octavio Paz's poem, A Boy and a Girl, um, that just haunts me. And when I was an adolescent, I was I went to the Arts Magnet High School uh, as a vocal performance major, and I was in the choir, and we performed, we performed many, many Eric Whitaker arrangements, which were notoriously difficult to do, to pull off, and it afforded us the opportunity to travel to New York City and perform in um, uh, amazing locations uh, as a choir, but it also really changed my relationship to reflection and spirituality and sort of devotion. Hmm. I'm going to need that playlist. Okay, cool. Luckily, we're recording this. <laughs> Are you on Spotify? I am not. I'm an Apple Music person, partly because I don't want people snooping upon my... Oh. Because I, the thing is, I listen to things on repeat. Um yeah. Goof-tastically so, right? Like I'll choose a song and I might listen to that on, on repeat for like three weeks uh, anytime I'm listening to music. I don't need people to know how many times <laughs> I've heard Third Eye Blind's God of Wine, you okay. know? The, sure. the answer is embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, no one can tell like exactly how much you're listening. They'd have to like okay. really be paying attention. But what's cool about it is if you did create a sex depression animals playlist like people could find it not that we support spotify though because they amongst many other um ways you can listen to music do not pay musicians enough mm. um so let it be known i'm not supporting spotify here but if you had one on spotify i could look it up but we uh, could support sex depression animals on spotify <laughs> right hey, there's that there's authors that. need it <laughs> there's that um, I was wondering if you would read Wedding. Yeah. I love to read Wedding. And again, like the theme here, which I find really fascinating. Um, this is again, one of the oldest poems that, like I wrote this piece initially, I want to say toward the end of my MFA program. So a solid, um, five, six years before the book was ever picked up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that for folks who read the collection from front to back, you can see that there's a little bit of a difference in style and in diction in this piece compared comparatively, but like the tone and the themes are the same. Mm. Wedding. Still simmering from the last sips of champagne, we stayed in the old boathouse beside the lake and began taking down decorations, unfastening, untying, unwinding each thing we'd assembled for your sister the day before. I followed every familiar gesture, the language of longtime friends. We only had the room until dawn, and I, your date in the absence of your spouse, helped undo any pieces that could be undone. First the tool, once netting lavender light, gathered in ectoplasmic bouquets, then the discarded stems of each sparkler. With mine, I'd streaked hearts as the bride stepped from the porch. You'd held the lit wand to your lips and pretended you would swallow the glow like a sun. We took the baby's breath, violets and blue bonnets from their vases and scattered them in the lawn. We snuffed each candle out, until nothing but smoke slinked toward the wood-planked ceiling. The moon poured its pale sheen, its light 
somehow a bright shadow. We shook the silver glitter from each tablecloth, watched the fabrics linger like water above us a moment, then let them fall to our bodies. We carried the altar out to the neighbor's truck bed. His headlights swayed to the west and diminished. No trace of ceremony left. We stepped from the airy hall to the banks of the slick black lake. I stood, hungry, at its lip. I thought to immerse myself. I thought to push you in. The darkness began to become us. Ugh. There are moments where, like, my roommate will get concerned because I will audibly react to what I'm reading, like, and sometimes yell, and he'll be like, are you good? And I'll be like, you held the lit wand to your lips and pretended you would swallow the glow like a sun? Are you serious? <laughs> and he'll be like, yes, great line, great line. But he'll literally think that I'm like unwell. Um, which I love that you're in there professing like that. Oh, it yeah. It gives me great joy. Oh, yeah. Always, always. And I'll be like, listen to this. He'll be like doing something. I'll be like, listen <laughs> to this. And like... But uh, this poem has so many beautiful moments for me. And as like somebody who also works in film, like this poem could be a short film. Mm. Um, as well as I, I love prose poems. The girls have differing opinions on prose poems. Not all of the girls agree, yeah. but I love prose poems and a lot of us uh, love prose poems out here. I think people are scared of their power. And this poem in particular might be one of the reasons why people are scared. Mm. Well, that's nice of you. And spoiler alert, uh, my second manuscript is chock full of prose poems. So, I mean, I do think that they help you get toward a certain kind of recklessness, right? Uh, for one thing. Also, funny aside, uh, that poem too is is based on a true story. Um with one of my dearest, oldest, closest friends. And um, I remember when he first read the book, he texted me and he said, you thought to push me in? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> I love yeah. that. And you were like, and? Truth. But I didn't do it. You thought. We have lots of thoughts. Everybody has lots of thoughts. That's right. That's right. Exactly right. Um, and good on you. And good on you had you pushed him in, TBH. Um, so my next question for you is sort of thinking about how like uh, the book is sort of like, like a landmark or like a pin along the journey on your mm -hmm. like road as a writer. Yeah. Um, and so I think you've, you've, experience my like new year's slash birthday questions um so i think a lot about like what we're leaving behind and what we're bringing with us a lot because i like mm -hmm. to personally like mark that for myself um so my question for you is what poetics did you leave behind in this book and what are you taking with you yeah a very uh appropriate question following our recent conversation. So um, I'm definitely taking with me an interest in playing more with sort of recklessness and especially with the prose form, um, but also with visual forms. So for example, there's a series in the collection called The Breakup, um, series of sections in the collection called The Breakup that are, if you see them, a sort of visual form. Um, a type of erasure, a form rather of erasure that I invented, where you take a single sentence of your own, um, mm -hmm. copy and paste it below however many times, and then use um, the feature of changing the font to white mm -hmm. to uh, erase, you know, elements as the as the lines repeat below so that you can create sort of a new narrative. I definitely play with a lot of visual forms too. Uh, and and do some sort of new experimental work in the new um, manuscript in progress, tentatively titled Why on Earth? Um, I, but at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, on this sort of much less meticulous end, play with not just 
prose poems, but broken up prose poems. So they have sort of stanzaic breaks, but not linear breaks. They don't break the lines. Um, I'm very interested in that collection in ekphrastic poems. So mm -hmm. one that I sometimes will read from this collection um, as a departure point into the new collection, which is interesting because I never thought of it at, this way at the time. It was okay. written kind of in the middle of the process of this book, but the poem David um, mm -hmm. after Michelangelo mm -hmm. and after his sculpture, David, um, in particular, I, I have a number of poems that deal with Michelangelo, but um, also ekphrastic poems in general in the new collection. So for those of you who are um, not sure yet what that means, ekphrastic poems are just sort of poems that are written with specific works of visual art as their inspiration point. Um, and then there are also a lot of poems that are interested in sort of what's in the zeitgeist right now, space-time, quantum mechanics, um, quantum entanglement, and the idea of sort of what's real, what's not real, um, and what does it mean for us to forge connections between each other? Mm -hmm. And I think that some of those things begin to manifest a lot in this book because I'm very interested already in duality and multiplicity and trying to create many layers of meaning where the poem on the one hand means exactly what it says and, and you shouldn't ideally have to know any more than that in order to sort of understand it. But on deeper levels, there are these additional interpretations, these additional ways of reading and layers of meaning um, and none of those things are mutually exclusive, but they sort of just accumulate upon each other. Mm. And on top of the the reader always, of course, reading through the lens of who they are as a person, which is infinitely different from you. Absolutely, absolutely. And that too, that idea of sort of perspective and context and what it means to be situated, you know, those, th those are things that I'm playing with a lot as well. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Well, I speak for everyone when I say we're all very excited for book two as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've got uh, one more question and one more um, request from you, and then we can get to our audience Q&A. Um, so my last question before I request is um, if you could put this book in the hands of anyone in history, like anyone over time, whose hands would they be? Dang. Okay. I'm glad that you threw that first before the poem request so I can be like secretly marinating on this for a second. Okay. <laughs> can, may I marinate for a second? You may marinate. Um, and um, the, the, the next request from me, let me just doubly make sure, is uh, lace. Lace. Okay, great. So um, yeah, I'm marinating. You marinate. And the thing is, I like I want to answer it because I'm also going to be distracted if I try to like read this poem and I'm still thinking about it. Um, I think that you'll know what I'm talking about, Seamus, and many of you who are listening will know what I'm talking about if you are writers. Um, it's very hard to separate your heart from what you're working on currently. Um, and so my answer would be sort of in a way more geared toward the work that I'm doing now, but also in a way geared toward like the core of my interests and my heart and my questions about what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. So I like, I think my initial impulse and who knows, I'm gonna probably, Seamus, I'll probably text you at like three o'clock in the morning, Dallas time and be like, this is actually who it was. <laughs> I didn't think of them, bah. But my initial impulse, the first person that comes to my brain is Leonardo da Vinci. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so lace. Lace is meant to sort of look lace-like. For those of you who don't have the book, it's um, sort of prosy looking, but then it has these slashes to indicate moments of rest, sort of like um, a moment where you would pause and take a breath like a line break. And so those are meant to sort of 
replicate stitches, stitch work um, in the poem and to, to make it look a bit like lace. Mm -hmm. And this is one of quite a few poems in the collection that um, is partly meditating on etymology, the root of a word where it comes from. And so if you were reading the book on the page, you would see there are a number of phrases that are italicized. And sometimes that's because they come from um, the etymological dictionary of, you know, this is the sort of ancient history of the evolution of this word and where it originated. Mm -hmm. Lace. A piece of cord used to bind or close openings. The satin corset I wore to a frat party. Flimsy stitches, paper snowflakes, trimmed skirted legs, a man leaning in whispering, do you shave everything? The root is shared with old French for ribbon or string, with Latin for snare, with English lasso. Some men I know still like playing games, like pickup, linked elbows, plastic cups arranged in shiny bouquets, like every lip touching so it's easy to aim, drinks all mixed up, eyes blackened, blurry, shadows, sheets. In the 1590s, to be laced meant beaten or lashed, as in patterns on skin, a placeholder for feminine, as in frilly, undone easily. Do I have to say please? Ripped panties, the seeds of Queen Anne's lace, eaten to prevent a pregnancy. Every man who's ever asked me, do you want it? Plucked petals on a daisy. Every pain I could have named, avoided. Every time I said, yes, I did. And it's one of many poems I should say that's, um interested in the act of defining, as you can hear when I read it, right? It's sort of an exercise in defining the word in these multifaceted ways. Yes, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I say this book could be read as a study of linguistics is because like, there are so many moments where uh, you as the reader walk away with more questions about those words and, and spend more time thinking about those words and what those words mean to you, Lace being one of them. I also love, um, I think, often um prose poems with backslashes are often things that i'm very cautious about because i think sometimes yeah. people do them for no reason and i hate yeah. it when people do them for no reason yeah um, but everything should have a reason yeah of course and there are very few poems i can name that i'm like this is an example of how to do this and this is one of them oh thank you so much thank you that means a lot to me yeah of course um well uh, I I will make some room for our audience Q and A. Um, I can't I can't say enough. Like if if you don't have a copy of Sex Depression Animals, you should grab one. Um, it's one of my favorites, and it's uh, a book that I keep in my frequently referenced section because I have to go grab it because I thought of something or wanted to review a poem or was talking about it. So definitely pick it up if you're in the audience. Um, I, we've got one question here. Um, I'm curious about the second part of it. Um, what is, first part is, what is your writing process? And the second is, are there parts of your creative process that you are impatient with, either yourself or the work? Such a good question. Thank you, Sherry. Um, absolutely. I'm not what I would consider to be a prolific writer. Although I do, I have a very devoted practice and I spend a lot of time writing that does not re result ultimately in a lot of poems. And that's okay. Um, and I know many, many incredible writers who are very prolific and who don't have to go through the same seemingly tedious process that I go through um, to get the same level of work. And that's okay. But for me, that's what it sort of requires and so my process is one that it, um, is multi-phased and also very fragmented. Mm -hmm. I will almost never sit down and draft a poem end to end in any type of way that would ever be recognizable when you look at the final form of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, 
I do a lot of research. I take a lot of notes um, and I will take sort of fragmented field notes as well about sort of the theme or the topic or the narrative that I'm turning over in my mind that I know is like a center piece of the poem. Um, but then I also have like a, a running, a document, a running list of sort of orphaned ideas Mm -hmm. images, lines, um, bits of research, all kinds of things, uh, stuff that I've cut from other drafts of poems, stuff that I just sort of randomly wrote in my notes app one day and didn't know what to do with, you name it. And so a lot of the time, part of my process involves going through that and finding bits of kinetic energy, as I would call it, mm -hmm. between the thing that I'm working on and something unexpected there. Um, because the whole point for me is that element of surprise. And, and in a way to get at that, I have to trick myself. I have to come at it in a completely different way. Um, I can't just be like, oh, what would I not expect? And let me <laughs> write that here now, <laughs> you know? So um, I'll go through the that document and some other things. And it's this very patchwork fragmented process. Almost none of my poems that have been published have fewer than 25 saved drafts in my computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and my process is one that begins longhand in uh, mm -hmm. notebooks. And I go through a few different rounds of revision before I ever put something even in the computer. Because a mm -hmm. lot of the time, it frankly, it doesn't turn out to be viable. And I have to just set it aside. And so it, it never makes its way to the computer at all. Um, so that's a, the most succinct way of talking about my process and also of just affirming that absolutely there are things that um, frustrate me about it because I ultimately I can't make myself a more prolific writer without making myself a worse writer. Mm. Yeah. Did you know that um, when you write something physically because you're going from left to right you're engaging both the left and right side of your brain? Mm. Mm. I did not. I can't really, I can't really, I mean, for scripts and for short stories, I have to type them most of the time because, well, at yeah. least for scripts, it's unfeasible to write them. Sure. Yeah. Um, but in general, um, with poems, I'm the exact same way. I have to write it in a notebook first. And then my friend was like, oh, that's because you're, it, it flows more freely because you're using your whole brain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also that for me, actually a big part of my process, strange as it may sound, is simply like I'll write the draft of the poem and then I'll look and I'll see the edits I want to make. And it's the physical act of rewriting the draft with those edits oh, yeah. and then iterating that over and over again that somehow does something for me uh, cognitively. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, I teach a class on the creative process and there's research behind what this does but it'd be much too deep and um boring to go into now but there is something to be said for just that act of physically writing things down and iterating it in that way too yeah 100 percent um one more question from yes. kellen uh yes so when and how did you find the courage to take poetry seriously uh, it's a really good question, and I love this question in particular because, in a way, it actually connects back to the big author, the big Texas author talk. Mm -hmm. um, I did not even understand that the world of contemporary poetry existed, much less know what that looked like or have any investment in it until I was an undergraduate student in college, and I had the amazing opportunity um, by just sheer chance and fortune that as a college student at Trinity University in San Antonio, I studied with Jenny Brown, a former Texas Poet Laureate, and just one of my favorite people in the world to this day. And I somehow I got into one of her classes as an underclassman when I think you kind of weren't supposed to. Um, and I fell in love and I became obsessed. And I was not particularly <clears throat> talented at it. Uh, and I say that with, in all seriousness, not just to be humble, um, but it was something that I was so obsessed with that I was just determined to kind of like invest everything and work tirelessly. And um, and I had the opportunity, the reason I say this connects back to the Big Texas Author Talk is because I had the opportunity, I think it was a couple of years ago now, 
to serve as the moderator for Jenny's um, time as her, when she was the big Texas author um, discussing one of her most recent books. And um, one of the things that I respect and love most about Jenny, she was in a lot of ways like a parent and a sister and a friend to me through my college years. And it's and it's rare to really forge that kind of relationship, even though I know that now as an educator, even though there are many students who I care deeply about and feel close with in some respect, um, but she remains like that important to me. And one of the things that I especially respect about her is that she didn't, um, <laughs> she didn't sugarcoat, right? And so she would be like, yeah, I see that you're obsessed and um, that's awesome and you're, making a lot of progress, mm -hmm. but like when I asked her, you know, would you write me some recommendation letters for MFA programs? She said, absolutely, of course I will, but I don't think you're gonna get in because you don't revise, you don't take that seriously. You think that you write something and it's gonna come out perfect. And that is not ever the case. And, and like, I needed to hear that. She wasn't being cruel at all. She was Mm -hmm. truly, you know, being a loving and helpful presence in my life when she said that, and I needed to hear it. And it changed everything for me. And I was really fortunate that I got into uh, many of the MFA programs I applied to, and I had the opportunity to push it further. Um, but that fundamentally changed my entire process. And I, I've never gone back. Like I've only, I've only pushed deeper into the tedious tinkering and revising and overhauling and demolishing. Um, and all of those things are thanks to her. And, and it's, and I can't explain what sort of gave the, me the courage, right? Because of course, no one, the, the reality is no poet is ever going to look at you and say, yes, you're so talented that you can absolutely make a killing off of this and feed and support yourself and a family and anything else, right? Because it's like, you can be the best poet in the world and potentially not do those things. Yeah. You can win the dang Nobel Prize and potentially not do those things. Yeah. Nobody's going to make those promises to you. And so ultimately, the thing that I think gave me the courage, silly as it sounds, was just my obsession. Um, but also knowing that there were writers who were who were the real deal who mm -hmm. cared about me and supported me and were willing to mentor me. Mm. Yeah. That's so interesting to know also because I know you as a fantastic editor. Like that's mm -hmm. one of the ways in which I know you. And I think there's, there's sort of this youth about that whole, like, I don't need to edit thing. It's a very young thing. And I think a lot of early writers have that where it's like, why would I edit? It's perfect. Um, yeah. I call it secret genius syndrome. And like <laughs> so many of us have it. So I'm I'm not yeah. here to to diminish anybody because I certainly came in with that. That's the moral here. But like when you haven't read that much, then then of course you don't know what is or is not innovative. You know, and and yeah. when you've taught, when you've taught in my case, you know, now for 10 years at the college level, you learn that, oh right when your students first discover poetry and first get passionate about it, they're all writing essentially the same poem. And it's earth shattering and life changing for them because they don't know anything else. You know, suddenly they've, they've discovered poetry, right? And they're writing the type of poem that many initial novice poets will write. And that's where you have to start. But the question is, are you willing to get into the grind? Are you willing to, to, you know, make the hard decision that it's not just about how I feel? Like if, if I want to be a poet, if I want to be at large, um, then it's actually how it affects my reader. And in order to understand that, I need to understand the domain period and everything that's been, every trick that's been pulled, you know, every play that's been made up to this point to the best of my ability. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. I always say like, you cannot chime into the conversation if you're not listening. Mm -hmm. Yes, 100%. And you certainly aren't going to be listened to as a part of the conversation if you're not listening. And, or, and, if, and if people know that you're in your own head. 
Yeah. So yeah. we're nearing time, Alexandra. Do we have time for one more question or should we should we wrap it on up here? Um let's just do one more. I, I'm madly typing in quotes from your conversation <laughs> into the chat. Yeah, just one more and we'll wrap it up, Seamus. That would be great. Yeah. Awesome. All right, we've got a question from Margaret C here. Um, for me, writing poems is a way I watch myself growing before my eyes. Can you relate to this? And is there a way you can describe what growth you've uncovered from beginning poems to final poems? Yeah, I really love this question. Um, there's a, a concept that I refer to as the discovery zone. Mm -hmm. uh, when I talk about writing poems with my students and what I'm trying to say when I refer to the discovery zone is the fact that a poem is not going to do its job in an effective way if mm. after you've written it, it says what you planned for it to say. Mm. You absolutely must discover something new via the creative process of writing the poem itself. Mm. Um, otherwise, it's predictable because if you knew what it was going to say, then guess what? I, a seasoned reader, also know what it was going to say. Yeah. And so, and I, I use the term, the discovery zone as like this loving reference to this bizarro place I used to play as a kid that had like a giant slice of cheese that you could crawl through the holes of and a weird little dystopian fake grocery store with all plastic <laughs> grocery supplies that you could shop in. Uh, and it was like surreal and bizarre in exactly the ways that a poem should be, um, so you have to enter the discovery zone and you know when you're hitting that flow and you know when you're not once you've gotten to the point where it's happened to you before and you have to be willing to follow the poem there and to let go of whatever plans you had otherwise. Uh, and I would just say that an excellent source on this is there's a wonderful interview with Jericho Brown that was published in the mm -hmm. Bennington Review years ago uh, that's still available online. And in it, uh, one of the questions he was asked was, what, what do you have to say to folks who are writing very explicitly political poems these days? Um, is there any, do you have any thoughts on that? And what Jericho kind of said is something to the effect of the trouble with writing very political poems is that in today's political climate, people tend to have very, um, concrete ideas about where they stand and what kind of message they want to convey. And in a poem, you have to enact a kind of transformation and you have to go past that dark edge into a place of the unknown. And most people aren't really prepared emotionally, psychologically to make the kind of discovery in a political poem that would allow the piece to transcend the predictability and to do something miraculous. Mm. And um, because a lot of the time that discovery requires some discomfort and some acknowledgement of complicity and, and some deep reckoning that goes way beyond the work of writing a poem. Mm. And so essentially, you know, what he said is, yeah, when you write a good political poem, that's amazing, mm. but damn, it's hard because mm -hmm. there's this barrier that we are so afraid to cross and poems demand that we cross it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow, great answer. Thank you. This has yeah. been so fun. This has been such a great conversation. <laughs> this has been so cool. Yeah, well, thank you all for being here and I'll, and thank you, Mag. And um, this has been so much fun and I love talking to you about poems. Um, so thank you. Uh, for allowing us to do that. And I'll hand it back over to Alexandra and Blake. Sure, no, thanks. Seamus, I think you win the prize for the best questions. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were great. Um, well, this was wonderful. I, um, you know, I'm, you know, half ha waiting very happily through your amazing book of poems. So everyone buy Sex, Depression, Animals. We put some links in the chat. Um, really mesmerizing riveting work um thank you and you know this is one thing we love to do just have great conversations about writing the world of writing and then the you know the pieces themselves so thank you everyone for joining us mag thank you so much Seamus thank you so much this was kind of like you know a treat for me to sit back and just listen 
And um, we look forward to seeing you next month, um, which I can't believe is already March. Um, and, you know, just tune in to the Big Texas Read. We will have this um, most likely posted on YouTube fairly soon on the Gemini website and, um, write, you know, writing workshop stylist. So feel free to re-experience it. And I'm babbling on and I'm going to let everyone go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks.